So uh, Pastor Brian wanted me to share, he is not playing hooky this morning. So you may not see him around here. Where he is, is he's actually speaking at a, preaching at a very special service in Mexico. They're having an installment uh, service at that church in Mexico that I believe Vicky and Pastor Brian planted, right? Am I right on that? Ish, I'm a, okay, I'm not very right. But here's the moral of the story. Pastor Brian is preaching right now, so pray for him as he preaches at this installment service. So he's ministering over in Mexico, and so he was fine during the earthquake and all of that. He didn't feel a thing. So he's, he's been good over there. God's been watching over him and protecting him. I uh, just want to give some information real quick. Um, yesterday morning at 7.52 a.m., my grandmother, Helen Creviston, went home to be with the Lord. And so anyone that is interested in like when is the service going to be and all that, it's going to be on Friday at 2 p.m. this coming Friday. It's a graveside service right over here at Fred Hunter's right across the street, right over there. And so if you want to come to that, anyone is welcome to come to that. It's at 2 p.m. on Friday. And so um, if you're here for the first time, my name is Brad and I'm one of the pastors here at Hollywood Community Church. And this is my beautiful wife, Kelly Crevison over here. And so she's an amazing woman that I can't believe God allowed me to marry, okay. I still ask myself, God, how did I, I don't deserve this at all, but yet he blessed me with a beautiful woman who pushes me and challenges me. And so uh, we're in a series on marriage called For Better or For Worse, and today's topic is about communication. And so you might be sitting there like, well, I'm not married, this doesn't apply to me. No, no, no. Everybody has to communicate at some point in time, whether it's to a friend, a coworker, a colleague. So communication is important. So this can apply wherever you find yourself in stage of life, whether you're married, single, want to be married, don't want to be married. Wherever you find yourself, take the principles that apply to you so that you can communicate in a healthy way to everybody you meet. Because God is calling us to have words that we speak, the way that we communicate it to be ones that he communicates to us in the way that he talks to us. And so I want to share like kind of a first encounter where my first encounter with Kelly did not communicate well. It was very awkward and very weird and it was a, a I'll just, I'm going to tell a story. So the first year that we met, we were going through teacher orientation and um, our school decided like, hey, we're going to go around from classroom to classroom. We're going to do a parade and just look at everybody's decorations. And I'm like, oh, wow, yippee. Like, this is going to be tons of fun. And so uh, while they had stopped in this room, in this hallway that was where my classroom was, there was a friend of mine who taught PE and taught music. And we were talking and we were just like, we don't really care about this decoration thing. Like, we could let everybody else do that. Like, we don't really care. Like, my, I'm just glad my mom and sister came and decorated my classroom. So I don't really care. Like, I got the approval from women, so I know it's good. And so we were talking and at that time I had been you know, on a very intense workout regimen, which clearly didn't stick. And um, so I was talking to him all about that, like, yeah, he's having me do these crazy things, do these dips with a, a, a weight chain and hanging a weight on below that and doing all these crazy stuff and I'm trying to get buff and uh, all of that stuff. Well, then I realized that I didn't hear any more talking in the hallway. And the next thing I know, the whole parade had left. And we were just sitting there, I'm like, oh, Alex, come on, bro, we gotta go, we gotta go catch up to the parade. So we walk down and we finally find him in this preschool hallway. And as I'm walking up, I told him, I was like, yeah, my friend who I'm working out with, he wants me to take this pill, but he won't tell me what's in the pill, you know? And I was like, and I asked him, what is this? And he's like, oh, don't worry about it, just take it, it'll help you work out. And I'm like, no, 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 I, I really wanna know what's in the pill. And he's like, no, like, it's okay, just take it. And I told my friend, I said, there is no way that I'm going to take this pill. What if this is an estrogen pill? I don't want to sit there and I don't want to grow. And I said the words. Now, at, exact, at that precise exact moment that I went, hey, she walked out of the classroom and only saw and heard that. And I look at my friend horrified like, uh... And I look back at her and she's like, <laughs> and I was like, look, you walked into the conversation at the wrong moment. Like, that's not really, and then we just turned and all of us just kind of went. <laughs> and we all went to our separate rooms and I called my friend Alex. I said, Alex, I have to say something. Like, she's going to think we're a bunch of perverts. Like, this is not good. Like, all I communicated to her is like, I'm this creepy guy. 
And so I went and found her afterwards, and I explained to her, I said, look, you, this is what happened. I explained the story. And her response to me was, yeah, not going to lie, that was pretty weird. And I was like, I have ruined any opportunity to become a friend of this girl. But clearly that didn't work out that way. Clearly, clearly. So fast forward a couple months, and um, Brad calls me one night. And I was at a candle party. I know, major throwback, candle party. And so I didn't answer. So I text him. I said, hey, what's going on? What's up? And he's like, oh, I just wanted to know if you wanted to, you know, grab dinner or something. And I remember being, like, so excited. Like, ooh, he's asking me out. Okay, great. Well, then the candle party starts. And, you know, I do all this stuff. And I get home. And I'm painting my nails, like, three hours later on the phone with my girlfriend. Like, what are you going to wear? Where are you going to go? How great is it going to be? And then I realized I never wrote him back from his original, will you go out with me, text. And so we're, what, like three hours later? Yeah, so I was sitting in a parking lot when I first texted her. <laughs> like, okay, I'm just going to wait and see because I threw myself out there, you know. Like, this could go either yes or no, I hate you, get out of my life. And so I'm waiting there and I'm like. <laughs> After about 45 minutes, I was like, okay, I look like a crazy, creepy guy sitting in a parking again, lot. All I'm seeing a scene. Again, right? <laughs> So I went home, and then I had told people, I had, te I had texted her, and they're like, so did she write you back yet? I'm like, nope, how long has it been? Hour and a half. I'm like, it's not a good sign, right? I'm like, that's a bad sign, right? I was like, maybe it's bad. And then two hours went by, and then finally three hours later, oh, I can't Friday, because I already have plans. And I was like, oh, great, I know where this is going. But then it was like, but we could do it another day th this coming week. And so um, for us, communication is... One of her, her cousins has a husband, his name is Eric, and not relevant, but um, <laughs> he has this statement he always says all the time, words mean things. Mm -hmm. Words mean things. And today we're going to look at this idea of communicating because words do mean things. And the things that we do communicate, they do either build someone up or they do damage and destroy you know, there's that old saying that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words never hurt me. Could not be further from the truth. Mm. Could not be more of a lie. Because sticks and stones, yeah, they're going to break my bones, but I'm not going to have the emotional damage. But words can penetrate. They can tear you down. They can destroy your faith. Mm -hmm. They can even destroy your even idea that you're even worthy of any kind of love from anyone. And so it's important. And so in John chapter 1, we're going to jump around to a few verses throughout today. And I want to start in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And this is what the disciple John says. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. See, very right here from the beginning of John's gospel, he tells us that the words that God speaks bring life. From the beginning pages of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he said, let there be light. Let there be animals that creep along the ground. Let us make man in our image. And over and over throughout scripture, you see the words that God speaks are words that bring life to those who hear. To those who are willing to repent of their ways. When you understand the words that God speaks, everything he does is for encouragement to show us his love, to show us his grace, and to show us his mercy. He has communicated through Jesus, who is the word exposed, revealed to us, that this is what love and life is. And so in our marriages, in our relationships, in our dating relationships, God is calling us to communicate the same words as words of life. But too often we as sinners, even those of us that are sinners but we're saved by grace, we struggle with our tongue. 
And we struggle with this. Proverbs 18, 21 says this, and it'll be on the screen for you. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Whatever words we speak, there's going to be a fruit that results. If we're speaking life, there is fruit that will come from speaking life with our tongue. But if we use it to bring death, that fruit will be present as well. And at the end of the day, it is our choice to how we use our tongue, whether to bring life or to bring death. And so when it comes to marriages, when it comes to relationships, I want to speak towards men for just a moment. Because words mean things. And I'm calling no one out. I know there's times where the things that I say to Kelly, the attitude that I give her, doesn't bring life. It brings conflict. It brings hurt. It brings pain into her life. There's a guy that I know that in front of me and another guy, his wife said something to him in the background, and he responds to her, newsflash, nobody cares what you think. And in that moment, I was just like, oh. <laughs> she gets mad. She gets upset. They have an argument. Comes back. I don't know why she's so mad at me. What? <laughs> Like, what do you mean? You just told her that her thoughts, who she is, doesn't matter. And there's so many men that are so flippant with their words that they are quick to tear down. You see, it comes from an idea that women are inferior to men. And let's be clear, women are not inferior to men. Men and women are created in God's image. Yes. Jesus died for women too. And if we are calling our wife names, if we are viewing them as less than us, shame on us men. Because women are beautiful. They're strong. They have a purpose. God has uniquely gifted them and talented them to do great things for his name. And if we view them as less than that, it's not honoring them as the person that God created them to be. They are equals in our marriage. We should pursue their well-being. We should use words that bring life to them, that lift her up, that tell her you are a strong, courageous woman of God. You are valued. Jesus gave his life for you because he loves you and he's got great things in store for you. We speak life to the women in our relationships and the women around us. Yeah, so... Um when, as we were going over this, talking about communicating death as a wife, the first thought that came to my mind was the nagging wife, the stereotypical nagging wife. You know, you've seen her in movies and you've seen her on TV shows and cartoons, and some of you might be thinking like, oh, I know that person. And if you're not thinking that, you might be like, oh, that's me. But, you know, this has been going on for so long that even the Bible speaks about a nagging wife. In Proverbs 21, 19, it says, it is better to live in a desert land than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. <laughs> hey. <laughs> uh, I'm going to leave that alone. Um, it is February and it is about 200 degrees outside and it's still not a desert. So I can't imagine living in a desert, but yet it says it is better to live in a desert than with a nagging wife. Like, that's some real talk. Doesn't stop there, though. Proverbs 27, 15 says, a continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. <laughs> yeah. So I remember growing up, I had this friend that she would always talk for some reason about how country used dripping water as torture. And I never understood it. I always thought that was weird. She always wanted to try it out. I don't know. And until I, like became a grown-up and then it's, you know, you're laying down and the house is quiet and then you hear that drip and you're like, where is that coming from? And it makes you crazy. 
that's better than living with a nagging wife. Ooh, that, that cuts deep, that cuts to the core. Ladies, we gotta do better than that. We have to be intentional to not nag our husbands. And how do we do that? Well, the first point in your outline is we communicate life. Krev already talked about it a little bit, but we communicate life. Ephesians 4.29 says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And when I read that, the three things stuck out to me. Our words should be good for building up and give grace to our spouse, to our partner, to our friend, to our parents. Not corrupt them, not bring death to them. We need to speak life and courage. And so as we were going through this, we were like, well, what, is, what does that look like in our marriage? How do we communicate life to each other? Well, that's me as a wife, every single day, making an attempt, being very intentional to not be a nagging wife. Even if it means, you know, I asked him to take out the trash, and he didn't take out the trash. And I say, hey, can you take out the trash? And he didn't take out the trash. You know, sometimes I just might have to take out the trash myself. Or, you know, we have a project that we've been working on for almost a year. <laughs> I'm watching YouTube videos to learn how to do it, okay? I'm learning, strategizing. And even though it makes me crazy, I need to remember that he, that's not his only thing going on in his life right now. He's got a job and he's got his own worries and stresses and hobbies and all this stuff that I need to remember when I want to say, why didn't you do this yet? So every day, I remind myself, don't be an agony wife. Now there are days where I'm like, oh, you failed at this, you nagged him today. But more often than not, I really try to be, speak life and not nag. Um, another way is um, I'm his biggest cheerleader. You know, when we got married, the pastor who married us said, one of the things he said was that I need to be Brad's biggest cheerleader. And you know, in that day, like you're so excited, you're like, yeah, I'll love him forever, I'll cheer him on every day. And then real life happens, but then, he, Still waiting for the pom-poms. <laughs> he started bringing that up more and more. Like, remember, you know, in, in sarcastic ways and funny ways and joking ways, remember, Matt said, you're supposed to be my biggest cheerleader. And I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. So then he starts doing weddings. And in, in the ceremony, he said to the bride, you need to be so-and-so's biggest cheerleader. And it's like the Lord hit me in the face, like, hello, this matters to him. You need to encourage him. You need to speak life to him. And I was like, whoa, huh, maybe there's something to it after all this time. Maybe. Um, another way is just the way we speak to each other. Um, nicknames, um, kind, joking, the way we text each other. You know, we text back and forth throughout the day, here and there. Um, and I heard this song the other day that really sp spoke to me about this. And so part of the chorus says, there's a difference between miss ya and I miss your face. And there's a difference between what's going on and baby, how was your day? And there's a difference in love ya and I love you. And I was like, man, this guy's preaching right now with this song. I know when we first started dating, we had conversations about that. We're like, don't tell me love ya. That's what you say to your friends. That's what, you know, it's just, no, I want to hear I love you. And so we're very intentional when we text. You know, I'll say, hey, lovey, how's your day? He'll write back, oh, hey, beautiful, what's going on? And some people, you know, think, oh, you guys are like way too much. What? But that's how we speak life to each other. That communicates we love each other, we're encouraging each other. Another thing he saw was, I have a daily alert that goes off on my phone um, and just says pray for Krev. And so every day, it just, um, at 10 a.m. it goes off and I say sometimes a quick prayer, like Lord be with Krev today. Um, guide him, bless him, direct him other days, you know, where he needs Jesus. The prayer might be a little bit longer. <laughs> What? <laughs> but he saw that one day, and he's like, what's this? And I said, oh, you know, I went to a conference, and they just really challenged the wives to pray for your husbands daily. 
And he was like, wow, that's, that's communicating life to me. That's showing you that you love me, that you think enough of me to pray for me every day. So little things to big things, we need to communicate life to our spouse. And for me in, in our marriage, our relationship, um, there are things that I've decided to do, just me personally, to communicate love to her so that she feels valued that she realizes that the things that I'm speaking towards her, they do bring life to her. And one of those things is, you know, I know that there's people out there all over the place where I've heard this phrase many times where so-and-so is my work wife, I have, this is my celebrity crush and all this stuff. And for me personally, I decided early on that with, when it comes to Kelly, the only girl that I'm going to call beautiful, the only girl that I'm going to say is hot and sexy and is my beautiful woman is my wife. And so I don't say this is my work wife or anything. I say the only person that matters to me is the girl that I'm in a relationship with. And I don't make comments about women of the opposite sex. I can say that's a nice lady, but there's nothing. Every comment that I give is towards Kelly and towards my wife because I want her to know that I'm thinking about her that I think she's the most wonderful woman in the world to me and that I don't desire anyone else but her. And so the words that I speak and communicate to her, I want them to bring life into her relationship so that she doesn't have to wonder, does Brad think I'm pretty enough? Does Brad think that I'm a great person? No, I want her to know that. And I want her to know that I'm not looking outside of my marriage. I'm looking at my wife and she's beautiful, she's strong, she's courageous, she's everything to me. And so what I communicate, I wanna make sure she gets that across. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we started to do, and this is hard to do, because in any relationship there's conflict. Mm -hmm. And there's always going to be times where that person is just sandpaper to you in that moment, and they're irritating you, and it's like, man, I just really want you to like go outside, like <laughs> go shopping, do something. And, but there's one thing that we've always made it a habit to do is no matter whether it's through um, talking on the phone or leaving the house, is we always say these three words, I love you. And that's hard. But it's helpful and beneficial because we can be upset and have an argument, but the last thing we tell each other is despite whatever's happening in our relationship, I still love you, mm -hmm. I still choose you, I still want to be in this relationship with you. And so for us, we sit there and we say, you know, this is how we're gonna communicate life. It's to always say we love you, whether we get off the phone or leave the house. And communication is such a big deal to marriage because everything communicates in a marriage, does it not? Right. It's words that we speak, but it's not even words. You don't even have to say a word and you can communicate a lot. Mm -hmm. I can come home, plop on the couch. Hey Brad, how was your day? So how was your day? And then she'll always say, good talk. <laughs> And I can say nothing. I can give her an eye roll. I can give her a hand gesture like, Psh. I don't have to say a word, but I can communicate. Silence is communicating. Mm -hmm. Eye rolls is communicating. And so many times we just focus on, well, I'm not going to say anything. I won't, I, won't, I won't say words because then I'll communicate something I don't want to communicate, so I'll just sit there and I won't say anything at all. That doesn't help the relationship either. That doesn't communicate life. That communicates you don't care about the other person in that relationship. You don't care enough to even talk to them or acknowledge them. So even nonverbal things interrupt healthy communication in a marriage. You see, because when you guys were dating, or maybe you're in the dating stage now, there are things that you would always do. You would go and you would hold hands, you would hug, you might sit really close to each other on the couch because you can't sit any far away because, like, oh no, I want to be right next to you. <laughs> That was me and Kelly was like, okay, can you please scoot over just like a few inches? Keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, <laughs> but there are things that you do in your relationship that when you're dating, you're doing all these things. But what happens when nonverbal begins to appear in your relationship and you don't get it under control and you don't try to make sure that you're speaking life, what happens is, is people no longer are sitting next to each other on the couch or sitting on opposite sides of the couch. They're going days without even communicating or talking to one another. Some of them might be sleeping in the bedroom while the other person is sleeping on the couch. And all of a sudden now, what should be this beautiful growing relationship has now gone cold and distant and now death has crept into that marriage. And so it's important for each of us to realize that it's not just the words we speak that mean things, it's even our nonverbal communication that can speak life or it can speak death.
Yeah, I learned this the hard way, um, lots of times, but my facial expressions, you can tell what I'm thinking at any time of the day by the look on my face. And I try to work on this, but it is going to be the death of me. So example, this week, Thursday, or at school, you know, it was a hard day with everything that happened. My class, we decided that we're gonna make kindness cards. Um, and I said, you could pick whoever, it could be a friend, it could be a teacher, whoever you want. So we're making a list on the board of people they wanna make a card for. And one of my students says this one person, um, the staff member, and I was surprised, if you will, that they said that person. So as I'm turning to write their name on the board, in the sweetest, most innocent, six-year-old little girl voice I hear, why did you just roll your eyes, Miss Creviston? <laughs> and I was like, busted. Oh, <laughs> called out by a six-year-old for my face. Ugh. So, it's gonna be the death of me. But that doesn't mean that I let it take over. I still have to make an effort to fix your face, Creviston, is what I tell myself when I can feel it like, oh. And so how do we combat nonverbal death? Well, we value truth telling in our relationship. And so if he sees a face that I'm making or I see, say, hey, pause, what's with the face? And then we have to talk about it. And sometimes my face might be because of something that happened at work six hours ago and I'm just still thinking about it. But he doesn't know that. He might have just asked me a question. I've got like the stank eye. And he's like, whoa, I just want to know what you want for dinner. Mm -hmm. And then when mm -hmm. he calls it out, I say, oh my, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean it. Sometimes I might mean it. And then I have to say, mm, you're right, you're right. We gotta, we gotta call this out. We gotta get to the root of it. We gotta talk this out instead of nonverbal, silent treatment, stank face. Yep, and so not only are we to communicate life in our relationships, but also we need to communicate love. Mm -hmm. And communicating love is important as well. And this is a, a we're gonna, we're not gonna, I know it looks kind of scary on your outline, like, oh my gosh, we're gonna be here for the next six weeks. We're not gonna <laughs> do that to you. But uh, we're not going to go the long. But this is a section where Kelly and I have truly seen the value of adding this to our marriage early on. And it was something that we learned while we were um, engaged, before we got married, that was truly helpful for us to truly love each other in the way that God has designed each of us. And so uh, there was a time where when we were dating, it was the first Valentine's Day that we had uh, to celebrate. And I remember sitting there saying, I want to make sure that I make this special. Now, I can't remember what gift I got for her, but I remember I was like, you know what, I'm going to write her a poem. Now, I'm not a poet. I don't write poetry. But I thought, hey, you know what, I think she might value this. So I sat down and I wrote her this really long poem. I was writing, like my hands started cramping. And I was like, yes, okay. And I thought it was, oh, hey, it's not bad. It doesn't sound horrible. And so I give it to her and she reads it. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe is she going to like this, like this? And she gets done, and she's like, and I'm like, did you like it? And she's like, yeah, it's nice. I think my reaction was probably a little more than that. No, that was pretty accurate, <laughs> pretty accurate. Uh, and I asked her a follow-up question. I was like, are you sure? Like, was it bad? Did I not rhyme well enough? And she's like, no, it was, it was nice. It was good. And I was just sitting like, that wasn't the reaction I was going for. Now, flash forward, and we were married. And um, she was at work one day and I said, you know what, before she gets home, I'm gonna surprise her. I'm gonna completely clean our, our room, get everything organized, clean, vacuum, whatever. So she comes home, I'm like, I close your eyes. We're gonna go into the bedroom. She's like, what are you doing, you weirdo? And I'm like, just follow me, okay? Just keep your eyes closed. So we get into the bedroom and I tell her, okay, now you can open your eyes. And she looks around, she sees it's clean and she goes, oh, you do love me. And gives me the greatest reaction that I was looking for with my poem. <laughs> Y'all, the poem was like eight years ago. <laughs> Doesn't matter, okay? But I realized, and in that moment, I realized something. I, I was like, wait a minute. When we first got engaged, I read this book called, we read this book called The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. And I remember sitting there thinking, what? 
okay, this just made a total connection for me. Like this is real life played out. And I remember thinking back that one of these things in the five love languages, I realized that she had, and when I did it, she gave me the reaction I was looking for. Like, okay, now she knows I do love her. And so we want to take just a few moments to briefly walk through these five love languages. We're not going to like dissect them and stay here and park on them forever. But here's what we want you to understand. The whole premise of the book is this, is that each of us in this room have two primary ways that we receive love. And that each of us have what he calls in the book a love tank. And that our goal for each person in the marriage is to fill up each other's love tank by loving them the way that they receive love. Because the way that I receive love is different than the way that Kelly receives love. So I can't say I'm going to love you this way because this is how I receive it. i got to fill her love tank up the way that she receives love. And when I do that, she will feel loved, and in turn, she will love me the way that I'm loved, and I will feel loved and satisfied in our marriage. And so the first one is this, is words of affirmation. And the little description there on your notes is this, is that it's unsolicited compliments mean the world to you. If you would have appreciated and loved my poem, you are words of affirmation. Okay? For the record, guys, I still have the poem, okay? I just want you to know that it's kept with all of our stuff. Second love language is quality time. Um, that's when having someone's full, undivided attention makes you feel truly special and loved. So if quality time is your love language, you crave time with your partner. You want that uninterrupted time where you are the main focus. That could be anything from exercising to do a ho doing a hobby, going out to dinner, hanging out on the couch, or watching Netflix. As long as you guys are together, uninterrupted life is good. Yep. The next one that you're going to see there is receiving gifts. Now, let me give a disclaimer. This is not the gold digger, okay? This is not the idea of the materialistic person who is all about buy me things. What it is is I want you to catch the description. It says the perfect gift shows that you are known, cared for, and prized above whatever was sacrificed to bring the gift to you. This person loves it when you get them a gift where they could sit back and say, this person had to think about me, went and took time to go get it, and had to sacrifice money to get it because they knew that I would love this gift. This person, wow, they got me this gift that I, that I, they know me. This person gets me. This is what gifts communicate to that person. It's not a materialistic thing. It's just something where they say, wow, you really do love me because you know what would really speak to my heart and to my life. Right. The fourth love language is acts of service. And this is anything that is done to ease your burdens or responsibilities speaks honor, love, and respect. So if your love language is acts of service, like he touched on a minute ago, it's anything that helps you out. That could be um, cooking dinner, doing the dishes, taking out the trash, um, washing the car, filling it up with gas. Anything that makes your life, even from small to big, easier, acts of service is your love language. And the last one is physical touch. And this is something that just, it goes beyond um, anything. It's really any hug, pat on the back. It could be a simple touch on the shoulder, holding hands, whatever it is. This speaks and communicates love to the person. And, you know, there's so many, most guys have physical touch as their love language because we crave the fact when Kelly comes by and she's like, just touches my head, it communicates that she loves me. And mm -hmm. so if physical touch is yours, whether you're a guy or a girl, when that happens, that is something that you feel loved and concerned and cared for when that happens. Right. And so um, in Ephesians 5.33, it says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. We all want to be loved, right? I mean, that's we all crave, no matter how much we say we don't like feelings, we all crave love from someone. And so in that way, we are supposed to love our spouse as much as we want to be loved, not necessarily in our way that we receive love. You know, he talked about my love language is acts of service, and his is words of affirmation and physical touch, surprise, surprise. And so I had to learn to love him through words of affirmation, where, you know, the poem, like, I, I feel very uncomfortable when I start talking about feelings, and I just think it's weird. But I learned that that's what he loves. So sending him a text saying, like, I, I need you, I appreciate you, you're the greatest husband in the world, fills up his love tank to where then he will do acts of service to fill up my love tank. So it's kind of like a cycle. You see what I mean? 
I do things for him the way he receives, he does for me, then I go back and return. So we have to love our partner in the way that they receive love. Yep, and it's not a, I'm gonna do this just so she can scratch my back. It's not what it is. What it is is God has brought Kelly and I together and I wanna love her and be a good steward of this relationship that God has brought into my life. And in order to be a good steward of her, I need to love her the way that she receives love. So it's not, I wanna do this just so she can love me. It's, I have to honor her. You know, God has brought us together and I have to cherish her and I have to do whatever I can to love her. So it's a, I'm gonna love her because I, I, God's given me, given her to me and I need to honor that relationship and love her and lift her up. And so I need to love her the way that she receives it. Does that make sense? Right. You with me? Okay. And so there's, and, and I've seen this play out in real life where there's a, a guy and a girl where the girl values quality time and the guy's doing things outside on their own and they're doing all this stuff. Well, the girl gets upset, they have an argument and the guy thinks, okay, what I'm going to go do is I'm going to buy a bunch of gifts, I'm going to give it to the girl. And then he's like, all right, here's all the gifts, I'm sorry, I apologize. And then the girl's still upset, it's like, oh, hey, those gifts are nice, but I'm still mad. And he's like, why are you still mad? I got you all these things. And here's the reality is that he's not understanding that those gifts don't speak her love language. That what she's wanting is your undivided full attention. And so we have to be careful that when we sit back and we evaluate our spouse and say, man, what love languages do they have? The goal is so that we don't love them in a way that doesn't really speak love to them and communicate love. And so at the bottom of that section in your notes, I put a, um, a website address that you could go there. They have a quiz. It takes two minutes. Kelly did it the other day. And uh, it takes two minutes to do the quiz. But we found this to be something that is so helpful in our marriage that we've seen that each of us have been able to feel loved and have our love tank filled because we've been applying these principles in our life. Right. And uh, again, with this, it's not... It's not a, hey, these are the two primary ways to love this person, so I'm going to forsake everything else. It's more of, no, I'm going to make sure I focus on these two and sprinkle in the other because Kelly still likes gifts, right? Mm -hmm. She still likes physical touch and get hugged. And so you do all these others, but realizing that there's two main ways. If I really want to communicate today that I love her, I'm going to go home, I'm going to do the dishes, I'm going to clean the house, I'm going to make the bed, I'm going to do all this stuff. And guess what? I don't ever have to write a poem again, okay? Like that is a relief. (laughs) <laughs> All right, so, uh, so yeah, take the time. And here's the third thing, and we'll close with this, is that the last piece of communication is communicate peace. And so uh, communicate peace, and this is a, a big, 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 big topic because what destroys peace in a lot of marriages is, I'm going to illustrate it right here, is that this is the root cause of everything. I have this wonderful blanket right here, <laughs> in which I think is speaking the truth. But when it comes to peace and, and conflict, like my blanket, can you see it? Mr. Right, okay? So when it comes to conflict, I'm Mr. Right, okay? So just get that straight and we'll never have an argument again. Right, right, okay, honey. What he forgets is that I too have one and mine says, Mrs. Always Right. So even, love, when you think you're right, I'm still right. I don't think that's fair. Right? I don't think it's true. Yeah. And so here's the problem, though, with this mindset is that when you both think you're right and you get into um, a disagreement, it starts to escalate. Next thing you know, you're jumping on board the crazy train, destination of destruction, okay? You start yelling and screaming and name calling. And really, what you're doing is you're pulling your this blanket up over you as a, a guard, a shield. So you can't get hurt. If you could just get one more dig, because you're right, if you have just one more comeback at him, he'll be more hurt than me, so I'll win. But really, what we need to do is we need to put our guards down, we need to put this mindset down to the side and realize it's not about who's being right, but it's about making the situation right. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says this, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. And so how Kelly and I have dealt with conflict in our marriage is we sat down and we said, okay, we want to make sure that we come to a resolution before our heads hit the pillow. Now, with that, it doesn't mean that there's not still residual effects of the conflict. It doesn't mean that when I lay my head, okay, everything's unicorns and Skittles, we're going to bed now. (laughs) But what it means is that we have agreed to resolve it, at least say apologies when they're due, 
forgive when it's given, and then realize that we're waiting for the opportunity to move forward and to move past the conflict. And you see, we've, we want it to be where we don't give the devil an opportunity. Because the devil, notice what it says, do it, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Why? Because then that's an opportunity for the devil to come in and to ruin your marriage. Right. Because if you don't deal with the anger and you don't try to come to a resolution and communicate peace, here's what happens. You both go to bed angry. You wake up the next morning, you're still angry. That person goes to work angry. Bitterness creeps in, and then I can't believe that person said that. And then every hour that goes by that you don't get a text from the other person saying that you apologize, you get madder and madder. Like, see, they still don't understand what I was trying to say. And then you get home and you see the person and your anger is like, hi, hi. And nothing's ever done. And all that happens is the devil is sitting there going, yep, I've won. You've gone to sleep angry, and now I have an opportunity to kill, steal, and destroy your relationship. So we sat back and said, we have to have some kind of resolution before our head hits the pillow. And so how do we do it? We, how do we handle this conflict? Well, we fight fair. Yep. And how do you fight fair? James 1, 19 through 20 gives us the answer. It says this, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to every anger, well, sorry, slow to anger. Now, how many of us really have that nailed down 100%? None of us. This is all something that I struggle with. Like, I'm the type of person, my personality is I get angry and very frustrated very fast. And it's hard for me to be quick to hear. Because I know what happens is when we're in an argument and she's giving me her reason, I look at it as when she's giving me her argument. While she's talking, I'm listening only for this reason to come up with a counter argument. Anybody else in there do that? Well, I'm listening to what she's saying so I can smash her argument and get her to see that I'm right and win her over to my side. But what is that doing? That's not being quick to hear. It's not being slow to speak and slow to anger. And what does it mean to be slow to, to speak? That means pause when the other person talks. And before you reply, sit back and try to make a reasonable statement. It says slow to anger. What does that mean? That means we have to be aware. It's our responsibility to realize when we are getting very angry yep. that we have to take action to calm it down. And when we were in premarital counseling before we got married, this lady said something that was extremely helpful. She said, you know, when you guys have an argument, it is perfectly okay for each of you guys to say, one of you, whoever needs to, to say, I need to take a time out. I need to take a break from this conversation because I realize that nothing is going to happen that is going to be good. Anything that I say from this moment on is only going to make it worse. And we thought, man, what? that's a great idea. We'll never have to use that. We're in love. Everything's great. We'll never. In the eight, almost eight years we've been married, we've probably used three to four timeouts. And most of the time it's me because I'm so quick to speak. I'm quick to anger, and there's times where I have to tell Kelly, you know what, Kelly, I, I need to go take a time out. Mm -hmm. And then here's what happens when I go and take a time out. I sit there and I think about this whole entire argument, and like, God, why can't you just see it my way? And then God does this thing to me all the time. In a gracious way, he says, Brad, you're being an idiot. <laughs> and really, because what God does is he takes, I step out of that situation, and allow God to speak truth to it. And then I go back to Kelly and I say, hey, you know what, Kelly? I made a big deal over something that two years from now, we're not even gonna remember we had this argument. Right. And I'm sorry that I hurt your feelings. I'm sorry that I offended you. I was being an idiot to you. Will you forgive me? You see, time out, sometimes we may, just being in that moment isn't gonna help. We have to be aware and take those steps and so we talk about what we do to make it right. We say, hey, we're going to truth tell. And right now what I'm going to tell you, you can't get mad what I'm about to say. You just, I want you to listen. I want you to hear. And so both of us, we have to be okay. When, when Kelly says, Brad, I need a truth tell right now. And you can't get mad. I have to sit there and I have to take it and I have to eat it. Because what's the idea behind it? I really want to know what's going on in her where she feels offended. Mm -hmm. And she wants to go, know what's going on in my life, why I feel offended. And then we want to communicate peace. So we want to resolve it 
before our head hits the pillow. Premarital counselor said this too, never say the words never or always. You never do this, you always do that. Those are statements that are not true. Instead, when we say something, it goes, well, this is how it made me feel, Kelly, when this happened. This is how I feel. And we speak kindness to each other. To deal with conflicts and fight fear, we have to take responsibility when we are wrong. We have to seek repentance. Ask for forgiveness Mm -hmm. from our spouse. Mm -hmm. And we have to be willing to surrender to ourselves and say, I was wrong. You see, to communicate life, to communicate love, we had to be willing to communicate peace as well. You see, for me, in those moments when I'm angry and I'm in that timeout, I go to prayer. And anger can never be dealt with in a holy way unless you're praying in your marriage, even over an argument. So many times we can think we can handle the argument on our own, but look, it is through prayer. Because prayer is what grabs our hearts and tells us, man, Brad, you're wrong here. Mm -hmm. You need to change your attitude. Change the way that you view this situation. And so I titled this whole entire message, um, at the top of your page you could see, I titled it, I Surrender. And really, to have healthy communication, it really takes an attitude of I surrender, does it not? Well, what do I surrender to? I surrender to self. I surrender to the fact that the relationship does not revolve around Brad. Quite frankly, we're told in Ephesians, Paul says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. What did Jesus do? He gave him up, he gave himself up for her to present her holy, blameless, without blemish. And so the attitude of I surrender is me saying, I have to give myself up so that Kelly is loved. And I I kind of visual it like this, because surrender is hard. And visually, in our marriages, this is what it looks like. Kelly, You are beautiful, you are unique, you are special, you have a God-given purpose, you are a child of the king, you are a daughter, a princess, you are special, you are protected, you are empowered, you are bold, you are chosen, you are family, you are precious, you are strong, you are courageous, you are a new creation, Kelly, you are mine. You see? (laughs) The words that we speak, those are not words that I made up. You see, those words are each found in scripture. And those are the words that God speaks. I speak them to my wife, she speaks them to me. Why? Because these are the words that God has spoken over us. This is what God thinks about each and every single one of us in this room. All of you are beautiful. All of you are unique. You all have a purpose. You all are strong. You're all empowered. You're all a new creation. You are a family. You are chosen. You are glorified. You are sanctified. You're redeemed. You're saved. Your God loves you. And so in our relationships, in our marriages, We need to speak life, love, and peace. There's three important phrases that I would like to challenge you guys. You could do it if you want to. You could do with this as you please. But in your relationships, there's three phrases where if you begin to apply this today, it can change your relationships. It's three phrases. Be on the screen. I appreciate you. I need you. And I want you. Those phrases are powerful because it communicates that we are not self-sufficient in our relationships. It's not about me. It's I want, I appreciate that person. I need them and I want you. I choose you each and every single day to love you. Even though there might be some days you hate me, I choose you and you choose me. We communicate life, love, 
and peace. Would you close your hearts with me this morning? The worship team's gonna come out and they're gonna lead us in a worship song in just a couple minutes. And I don't know where all of your relationships are and whether or not you guys are doing well because here, I'll be honest with you, Kelly and I, we're not perfect at it. We struggle with it because we're imperfect people trying to live together and do life together and we hurt each other. And the reality is you tend to hurt the ones that you love the most. And so you might sit back and say, well, maybe I've, maybe you sit back and you think, man, I've blown it in this area and my marriage is a hot mess. What do I do? Surrender. Go to God. When they sing a worship song, maybe you have to come down to the altar and say, you know what, from this day forward, I'm going to commit to communicate life, love, and peace. I know I can't do it in my own strength. I need God's grace. I need God's spirit to do it in me and through me. Begin today that, remember, God's mercies are new each and every single morning. And any time that each of us sit back and we realize we failed and we tell God, God, I repent, I turn from this. Forgive me for this. I want to honor you in the way that I love, in the way that I live. God's spirit begins a work of grace in your heart and your life. But we got to be willing to surrender to our wants, to our selfish desires, so we can make those that we have a relationship with feel honored and loved. We're told to honor one another above ourselves. Father God, we would never know true love and words of life unless you wouldn't have spoken it to us. Father, every word you speak brings life, speaks truth, speak love, speak over our lives, Father God, and we are so grateful that you have chosen to love us even though we are not deserving of your love. Father, despite our sinfulness, despite our brokenness, you've chosen to love us. We can't understand it. We don't know why. But we thank you that you have, Father God. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your one and only son to die on the cross for us. And all who call upon his name, who call him Lord and Savior, shall be saved. Father, thank you for saving us, forgiving us, and showing us what true love looks like. So Father, I pray that you strengthen our marriages. Father, I pray for the marriages that are hurting and that are broken. Father, I pray for those that are in them that might think there's no way that God can work. There's no way that God can resurrect my marriage. But Father God, you raised Jesus from the dead and the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. And there is no marriage that is too far gone. There is no marriage that is too broken for you to resurrect and breathe life and see it come to be all that you have called that couple to be. Father God, we pray that you resurrect our marriages so that you would be glorified and people will come to know your name. We love you. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen.